The Roots of Success podcast is for the landscape professional who's looking to up their game. We're not talking lawns or grass here. We're talking about people, process, and profits. The things deep within the business that need focus to scale a successful company. From hiring the right people and managing your team to improving your operations and mastering your finances, we've got a brain trust of experts to help you nurture the roots of a successful business and grow to the next level. This is the Roots of Success. Welcome back to Roots of Success podcast. I'm your host, Tommy Cole, and today we have a special guest. It's Tim Tremor, the owner of Professional Grounds in uh, Northern Virginia. It's a full service commercial landscape company that was started in 1974 by his father. He has a lot of great information to share. It's going to be a great conversation. So let's jump right into it. Welcome, Tim. Yeah, nice to see you, Tommy. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's let's get right into it. We have a, a, a lot to go over, but so take me back. Your dad was running this landscape company, and all of a sudden, young boy Tim comes in and joins in, and and, and tell me how that all got started. Well, I, I'd even go back before that from when my, when my father started the business. He was going to go to Northern Virginia to start landscaping companies focused on. HOAs because they were new at the time in 1974 and everyone thought he was crazy. Like you're going to go mow lawn. Like how do you expect to make money? That seems insane. He did pretty well though, but he started in 1974. He had an incredible business. Um, it was very different back then. Obviously it was all paper. I worked there since I was 14 years old, graduated in 2003, you know, graduated Saturday, started working Monday. And in two, 1990, he started the residential design build department. So we were doing commercial maintenance and residential design build. Okay. Everything was going really well until 2008. 2008, he got some really bad news from three doctors that said, like, you've got about two years to live. And it was just prostate cancer, but it was extremely aggressive prostate cancer. That like, the Gleason scale was like 9.8 or whatever. Wow. Anyways, he would show up to the office some days, but he was not... Um, mentally here, you know, he was down in Florida seeing specialists and he, his full-time job was getting healthy. Yeah. I was too young to really run a business. We weren't that big of a business compared to now, but you now there's probably 40 or 50 employees in, I was actually running the residential design build department. Um, and it was going pretty well. It was just seemed to be a third of our revenue and, and 90% of our headaches. So when he left, it, we just kind of floated around for five, six, seven, eight years. Yeah. And things were, we were never making much money. We didn't grow that much without his leadership. And then in 2017, I just changed my title on my email to president. President. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm now the president. Yeah. I was like a, it was like a, um, it was like a dictator. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't think, I didn't think anyone would notice. And then like within <laughs> five minutes, someone came in and was like, are you the president now? I was like, I think so. I think I am. And, and my, just to mention, my dad, my dad is doing fine to this day. He never really came back to work in the same capacity and was going to get to retire. So I took over in 2017 as president. I made a decision very quickly with the guidance of Jim Cali. We had a lot of conversations about this. He thought it was pretty gutsy that I was going to shut down the residential design build department. Again, it was a third of our revenue and all of our headaches. Okay, I so really hold, hold right there, Tim. So the story goes, you're going to shut down an entire portion of the company because you thought that was the right thing to do as now president, right? And that was in 2017. Correct. And it was wow. it was shutting down a huge department, <laughs> cutting our revenue by a third. Yeah. And uh, it was scary, but I just knew we could not manage our core business with the headache of residential design build. Okay. So we shut it down cold turkey. It was an extremely difficult day. We had five install crews. I went and met with all of them individually. Some of them we wow. repurposed and then we had like five or six managers. And I, you know, I spoke with them all in order. I tried to keep it private until I spoke with everyone, but it was an emotionally exhausting day. I remember going home that night and just being wiped out. It was just yeah. tough. Yeah. So w w I ran the numbers all which ways and we didn't know how it was going to work, but I knew it had to work. I, I knew we had to work on the business as opposed to me being in the business, dealing, putting all my time in a des residential design build. So we shut it down. So w what was the trigger point to go from dropping residential? You figured out something was not working for your 
ideal client, your ideal business, right? What works for you is different than what works for everybody. But yep. there was a light bulb that's turned on and said, we can't do this anymore. Was it because of the headaches and the lack of profit and the operations, it, the way it was set up? I would say it was just taking all of our time up. Like I didn't, we didn't have time to work on our core business. We were not improving our core business because residential design bill was taking all of our time. And really, if you think about it, there's some amazing companies in Northern Virginia, residential design build. It was one third of our revenue. Are we going to be able to attract the best people if it's a small portion of our revenue or the yeah. best people going to go to the companies that that's all they do and they're incredible at it. Yeah. Uh, we had some great employees um, still. It, there was no way we were going to be really, really good at both things. And I felt like to be successful, we need to try to do one thing and do it better than anyone else. And that, yeah. that was our sole focus from once I shut it down. Got it. I think early in our careers as business owners, we do everything, right? We're the yes people all the time. And I think the light bulb was the actually using the word no, like we are not going to be successful at that. And we're going to hone in our craft in one section and do it really, 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 really well over and over and over every single day, right? Yeah, to me, it felt like a weight. Like I just had to cut that weight and go. It was just dragging yeah. me down and I think everybody down. So it ended up being the best decision I ever made. 2018, I, like I said, the numbers didn't work. We made an incredible profit that year. It was beyond what we ever could imagine. And we grew our commercial department to make up that revenue pretty quickly. And our systems got they have been getting better and better and better. And we've had record profits in 18, 19, 20, but from where we came from in 2018, where we are now is, is unbelievable from a culture right. standpoint, from our systems, profitability. And we've gone from about 45 employees to about 130 or 140 now. So we've grown wow. a ton as well with margin that, going up. That's great. That's great. So take me to 2018 and what you call savage mode. Credit to James Terry. We were in a, in one of our meetings, he goes, Tim's got savage mode. He can just go savage. And I take that as a compliment. I definitely went savage uh, for a bit. Yeah. When, when I took over and we shut down the landscape department, it was a race against the clock to fix our systems and become streamlined and incredibly profitable and, and improve our culture. And I started waking up at like 1 or 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. And I would just lay in bed till 6 because that's when I'm supposed to get up and go to work. And I did that for about a week. And I was like, man. I'm waking up because I'm stressed <laughs> and laying in bed for three or four hours every morning is making it worse because I'm not at work. And I, when I go to work, I'm tired. So then I started, I just started going to work. I remember driving to work one morning at like 1230 or one o'clock and I would work, work, work. And I've got an incredible wife that supported me, everything I was doing. And I would get home late, seven, eight o'clock. And it was really hard because, you know, we had young kids, but it had to be done. And I knew it was going to be short-term pain, but long-term gain. Love it. So, so a few of those things that you have identified between the, the two in the morning to eight PM at night, then full savage mode. There's a lot of good things that came out of that, that you implemented name off some of those things that you had to dial in, in your business. Yeah. Great question because we had to dial in a lot, but I would say some of the most important things were we didn't know our expenses. We didn't know mm. what our profit was on every property. And, and before we look, kind of looked at man hour goals, but we didn't know what our true profit was. So the first thing I did is created something that we know exactly to the penny, what our expenses are at every property. We looked at, you know, our gross margin on the contract work, you know, our gross margin on the enhancement work, our blended margin. And we knew in, and, and it took, and we had something pretty good at first. It's we're still even now making it better, but it's really hard. Like, you know, you've got unavailable time. How do you allocate that yeah. travel time allocating that? It's really hard to dial in and get, and get it um, really accurate. And we've really done that. But now we know, like if you have a conversation at a board meeting and you need to raise your price 10% because you're not making money, that's a hard conversation. Yes. Yeah. But if you know your numbers, and you know, when you, if you're going up 10%, that's going to get you to a 5% profit. You're confident in that. Like, let them go out to bid. We know our price is very competitive. We know our numbers and it makes that conversation much easier when you have the confidence of your numbers. Yeah, no, good stuff. So you also did quality scores, right? And you, you also did efficiency ratios, yeah, estimating system, organization chart, 
explain a few well, of those. Well, we one two things we did that made a world of difference is we created two incredible documents that made our sales team sell so much more because it speeded their process up so much. One is bidding um, enhancement work, which we call Sprout, and our PMES, which is estimating new maintenance contracts. Okay. We can get a you know two or three hundred thousand dollar maintenance contract. We get all the numbers in from our estimator, and we can put it all that information and, and bid that work and, and send a proposal in five minutes. It is so fast toggling on whether it's optional, all everything changes, there's no human error. Those were two huge, thing, huge things that really helped. And you mentioned we do, yeah, we do quality scores and efficiency ratios. So basically it's just a simple Google document that when our account managers are in the field looking at their properties, if they're there, they're gonna rate their properties. You know, there's like five categories, trash, the mowing quality, yeah. weeds on the property, stuff like that. They put the name in, the format already pops up through a VLOOKUP, you know, the, their name pops up as the account manager and they grade it, right? Those grades go to a, just a p simple pivot table. It goes on every one of our branches and you can see all of our foreman scores from A to, to D, right? And it's great competition. You know, if there's a crew that's a C, it lets them know, everyone sees their C. They don't like that. They're going to step up their quality, but also as managers, it's like, Hey, we need to work with this guy. We need to. We need to follow him around, make sure he's doing a good job. We're his coach, not his boss. Let's make sure we're helping him out. We want to get him to a B. And we let him know that we're on the property because we saw your C. We want to help you get to a B. So that's yeah. been really helpful in our quality. Good. Um, and efficiency ratios. Yeah, we just min our goal divided, you know, compared to actuals. And we we kind of post the th same thing up on the same TV. Cool. In the, in good. The so scoreboard is good for employees, right? Knowing how they're doing. All that data is good for a learning experience to improve the numbers, improve the profit along the way. Explain the org chart part. I guess what the puzzle piece was figuring out the putting the right people in the right seat. I think a lot of small businesses kind of struggle with what to do in that scenario. What's, what's some of your experience that you had to go through getting that dialed in? So we have account managers. Okay. We want our account managers to sell work. We do not want them in production jobs. We do not want them overseeing the crews. So we have account managers that have a portfolio of work of HOAs and we've got our field managers. They're the ones that um, are managing our maintenance crews. So typically a field manager for us will have five to seven um, mowing crews and a pruning crew that they will oversee. And then our account managers have a portfolio of work, but they work, to, they communicate a lot together. Uh, we try to get our account managers in certain areas, it's kind of hard to do because they might have a relationship with a property manager. So it kind of gets all messed up, but yeah, account managers and field managers. I think at one point we were seeing that together and it didn't work out too well. It's great because you separate that out, right? Account managers are, are focused on client facing communication and enhancement sales, right? Quality, all yep. that while people outside of them are producing the work. They're watching the hours, they're getting the crews out the door, yep. all of that, and that's separate. That's, there's no double dipping in those roles. Yeah, when, you have, when you're wearing two hats, it's really hard to take one hat off and put the other on. And really, I think people that are good, on, good at production, they're not necessarily good at sales and, you know, or meeting the client yeah. and, and, and vice versa as well. It's like, it's two totally different brain styles. <laughs> yeah, not many people are, are able to switch their hats back and forth and be really, really good at it. It's, it's extremely hard. I get it. Correct. So some of the things that you guys focused on is knowing your ex, um, expenses and everything's tracked and there's, you know, cogs, right? That was probably a big change from your dad, right? How did everyone adjust to that? And did they really understand the meaning behind that? I guess basically what we coach to is right. Managed by the line on that's what you were doing every single week and every single month you were managing every single expense coming out but that prepared your team greatly right when they're out there thinking about making that next purchase yeah so in addition you know previously i talked about knowing our gross margin of properties we did that that was a huge change but we also we used to have staff meetings and at the staff meetings you know we would go up for an hour and just talk about our finances and everything and i just could see people's eyes glazing over yeah now we we have a really good way of getting that information to where they understand it, where we have about 30 charts we go over each department. You know, we look at direct labor for each department monthly year to date. We look at um, 
our overhead as a percentage of sales. We've got you know, 30 charts that we go through and we look and in those charts, it's got this year and our previous four years. So it's a simple chart you make that shows kind of where we are compared to previous years really helps people understand a lot better. So that yeah. was something that's very helpful too. And we've got it to the point where I can update the numbers each month in five minutes and all those 30 charts are updated, you know, through Google wow. sheets. That's really great. awesome. Well, I, I do know from visiting your place back in July of 2019, not knowing who this guy was, but the one thing that stuck out in Tim Trimmer was the spreadsheet guru, right? I mean, is that self-taught? Because most of your businesses run like that, right? Yeah. So I enjoy puzzles <laughs> and Excel is a big puzzle. Like if yeah. I, if we need to know our direct labor and I need to get reports to the managers each week to manage labor. I don't like guessing looking at the GPS and saying, why are they to 7-Eleven? That's, I don't like to make micromanage like that. We give goals for what they want their direct labor as a percentage of sales to be for the year. Then they divide it up by month. And then every week we go look at a chart that shows this for your, this week, your labor should have been 20,000, you're at 21,000. And, and I'm not doing it. They're giving me the goals. I'm just giving them the feedback and it really, really helps. So that's, a, that's like an example of a puzzle. Um, yeah. You love them. Um, and I've gotten, I think, pretty good, but it is self-taught. I never took any classes or anything. You've got a question, you just Google it. It's it's just, how do I do this? It's really easy. Yeah. You just got to be disciplined and just grind. Yeah. And grind. That's what we talk about a lot in, in the people we meet across the country is having the data in order to make informed decisions, right? Most of us are going, oh man, I, we don't know if we're profitable. We don't know if they're efficient. We don't know if they're getting the job done. We don't know if they're winning every day. We don't know if they have sales go goals. And all of this has to be tracked in order to make good decisions to run your company. It's almost like the blood test, right? You can look super healthy from the, from the outside, but all kinds of crazy stuff might be going on on the inside, i.e. not profitable. So stay, you know, consistent numbers every single day, driving that business to know where you're at is probably key. I get it. Well, yeah, absolutely. Oh. And like with, with direct labor, I think that is by far everyone's biggest expense in the industry. And yep. I think it gets a, the least amount of attention. Uh, you know, we're looking at what our, our fuel is a percentage of sales. We can't control that. Like labor is the biggest thing. And when we started dialing in on that and giving every week consistent feedback every week, it really, really helped our bottom line a lot. Yeah, that's great. We sell labor. We measure, we measure everything. I, we measure everything a lot. Yep. <laughs> great, great. So let's talk about another topic that you put in bold on our outline here, and that is focus on creating a great place to work. What does that mean at professional grounds? People are important. <laughs> Good employees are important. We wanted to make sure that Every employee that was valuable to us stayed with us, you know, and enjoyed working at professional grounds mm -hmm. um, from the labor up to, you know, business development managers. So we work very, really hard on that. I think we had a lot of um, policies in place from the past and we've updated a lot. Like just this year, for example, our laborers said, we asked people that came in to interview and our existing employees mm -hmm. about biweekly pay. Well, they don't like it. And weekly pay is really important. So we changed it. It costs us, I think, $30,000 a year in payroll tax, our payroll expenses. But that's a win for us. We changed yeah. that. We yeah. give 20% of our profits back to our employees every quarter. We do a lot of cookouts. We used to nickel and dime our, our employees over uniforms. Like, okay, you get this shirt, but you pay us $2. We take out your check. Like, what are we doing? We just stopped doing all that. We said, you can have, here's a shirt. You have as many as you want. Just bring back your old one if it's messed up. We used to clock them out at the job site and say, you have a free free ride back to work. Well, do you think they like that? Like every day they get frustrated by that. It's not worth it. Just pay them to go back to the shop and make sure they're happy. A happy employee is going to work harder for you yeah. and be a better value for your customers. We've created a lot of systems in the office that are simple and effective. Everyone has an employee at their company that is absolutely incredible. You cannot afford to ever lose that person. And I think mm -hmm. your best people, you need to pay extremely well, way better than anyone else would ever pay them. It's, it's the best money you can spend. Good employees yeah. are hard to find. So we make sure we identify the employees and we're, we're constantly doing it. We've got a lot of really good employees now. Um, yeah. yeah, we really have worked hard in 
creating a great place to work. And someone came to my office the other day and they said, we just got a good team in place where everyone's nice, everyone's kind, there's no yelling. It's just a good atmosphere. I think it's a healthy atmosphere. And I think that comes from years of, you know, identifying your core values and making sure you're hiring the people that fit your core values and fit in your company. Yeah. You know, I had some things here when you take an account manager that's applying to work there and you're like, yeah, he wants $70,000. Okay, great. You know, I'm going to try to get him at 60,000. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, wait a second. Uh, what is it? Why? And, and I feel like professional grounds are like, sounds great. You want seven. We got you for 75. Um, yeah, because we value sure happy. And, and they walk in the door extremely excited, ready to go. Right. Yep. That's an example of what you guys do at PGI. Yep. And if they cool. keep busting their ass, you keep, you keep helping them out. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Good. Dial in your systems. One of the systems that I saw there in 2019, and hopefully it's still there going strong, but the morning rollout is one of the systems that we always talk about. And you've got this circle that's painted. Is the circle still there? The circle is still there. We actually repainted it. Cause it got bigger this year. Well, no, it can't get bigger. It's like we're, we're is busting it? the seams here. It's so, it's so much tighter than it was when you were here, Tommy, I cannot explain. It's, it's twice as tight. So the circle is there. We can't all stand on it, but we stand in row stack behind it now. Okay. <laughs> but the morning huddle is important. You know, it's like yeah. football teams have the huddles before their plays. We want to make sure we have a huddle before our before our day. And yeah. it's, we always talk about safety. We have safety topics once a week. We bring up safety up almost every day, but I think they're very important. And yeah. they, it's been a big part of our culture. Yeah, it's great. I always use Tim Trimmer's company as an example. He might have one of the smallest square footage lots at any landscape company I probably have ever seen. And oh, by the way, he probably shoves, I don't know, 20 trucks in that and they're packed in like sardines, but he has used the small space, extremely efficient when a lot of owners are like, I just need the biggest place. I need room to grow. No, go see Tim Trimmer's place because they are super efficient, but by God, the next morning when, you, <laughs> when you're rolling out and if you're in the front line, you better get on the gas and get out of there. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's less than an acre and we've got a hundred employees at this location. Yeah. It's tight. It's really yeah. tight. That's great. And well, I think, you, we, and, and we're going to keep, we bought that. We bought a building across the street, but I, I still think we'll be here another four years. I don't know what we'll do, but it's, we're going to make it work one way or another. Yeah. <laughs> May not be yeah. pretty, but. Well, it'll be tight. <laughs> it'll be great. Good conversation, Tim. I, I, you got some last minute takeaways and there's, there's a few good ones, but knowing your numbers again, and all the costs that go into the properties and wh why did you think that knowing your numbers was so good? Was it just because you're being in, in peer groups or what, did you hear it from certain people or you just felt like, like that was the way to go. Did, did your, did your father know the numbers as well? That kind of helped you leverage into that? Or is that something you grab a hold of? Well, I think it's, it was really hard to do it when it was paper. I mean, Excel wasn't, they weren't using that then. Um, but I knew it's a game. The gross margin is a game for every property. Like you want to try to get every property up to a certain margin. And, and now we're working really hard on identifying ideal clients, which are willing to pay a premium. They do snow, they do enhancements with us and, We'll bid those lower and, and, you know, to try to get more ideal clients, but it's a game you, you've got to, when you're doing every year, when you're doing increases on it, you need to look at every property individually, look at what they're, do they pay on time? Do they do enhancements? Do they do snow? What do we want this property to get to? What are they at now? If you don't know that information, you can't play that game and you're going to lose. You're going to have a lot of properties you're losing money on. You have some properties you're making too much money on and you're going to eventually lose those if you don't get them readjusted. Yeah. So. It is yeah. a game and it's a game that everyone should be playing. Yeah, I, I get it. You know, I hear a lot of companies that that do maintenance or they don't do maintenance. And, and the common denominator is like, well, you can't make money in maintenance, right? And that's the threshold. They like the the big installs, the design build or or the big the big sexy projects, but you are a great company to take that advice and go, oh, you're wrong because you need to know if you're making money on each and every single property, not collectively out of all hundred properties are you yeah. profitable, but every single property should be measured. And I think that's one of the biggest takeaways from you and your business. Yeah, 
Absolutely. I mean, you look at your profit, and if you don't know your numbers, you've got 20 properties pulling you down. Yeah. If you got rid of those 20 properties, or better yet, you gave them a raise and they, they approved it, like you're in a much better position than you were. Yeah. Yeah. So training, you mentioned that briefly early on, but um, it's one of my things that I, I stress a lot to Southwest Airlines and Chick-fil-A and all those great companies train all the time. And you had mentioned that you've got a weekly trainer, you got a head of training. Dive into the why there it's so important to have consistency. I mean, just because you've got crews that have been there for five years or 10 years doesn't mean that you stop, but you keep getting better and better each week and each year. Explain the importance of that. Yeah, so we we had, I guess we did this wrong for 48 years, <laughs> but <laughs> we had it, we would have a new employee that would come to work for us and he had a great attitude and we hired him. We sent him to a big property and it's like, we're like, here's an edger, go. And the property is five miles of edging, but you'll figure it out. I mean, that's, that's not a good way to go about it. We decided uh, last year that we needed a full-time trainer in the field. We hired 88 new people last year. Wow. So now when we hire someone new, there's an onboarding process. We had that before, but the biggest change was, which I think really helped is we would have a dedicated trainer that would go out and work with that employee for a full one or two days, literally working next to them. Like he's driving them to the job sites. He's got 10 things he wants to bring up. He's going to, you know, walk, teach him how to use the edger, walk with him, show him how to do it, then give it to him, you know, watch him do it and show him the boundaries of the property and be with him. Then at lunch, they're taking lunch. They're covering other topics. They're doing the same thing again on the way back to the shop. I think that really set our new employees up in a better place to succeed because we're not always going to be able to hire people that, that have 10 years experience and know this stuff inside out, right? We're, we're right. grabbing people that have great attitudes that we can train. And if we're doing no that, experience, yeah, we got to be able to train them. So yeah. I think that was a really big help. We're absolutely going to continue that next year, but we've also hired a, a, a head of trainer that's working on training topics, a 52 week training calendar, going to each branch once a week and doing training topics. So training is really hard, but we've really worked hard at being better at it. And I think we are. Yeah. Good. Good. I, I got, I got one more for you. I was looking at some previous notes from 2019. Good I'm pretty you. sure you're still doing this, but explain one of the really unique things that you guys do at your company is, and help me out here. This is a specific term where everyone on the crew knows exactly what to do when they pull up to a property. They know where to park the truck. They know oh. where the, the edger goes. They know where the blower goes. And it's it's defined route. What do you call that? And give us a little bit of example of why that is so great and what led you to do that. So we went, I went out to Pacific Landscaping and I at one of their, and that must have been 2018. 18, and that I was think. awesome. What an amazing company Bob Grover has and his partner, unbelievable. Uh, but one thing they had was process maps. And they showed yeah. us a process map on a piece of paper. And I saw it. I'm like, that's great. And it showed exactly where the crew should walk to edge and all this stuff. And I was like, but it's on paper. That's not going to work. Like they yeah. can't, they can't take that to the job site and look at it. So I was like, there's got to be a better way. And we like interviewed companies and nothing fit. And then we went to Google and we were like, ah, we got it. And it's free. Oh, there's Google again. Saves the day. So we, ha we have, we'll have the boundary of a property, different layers. We have where you park. We have where your attention to weeds are. Like it shows exactly which direction you should edge. It will take, if, you know, some properties of ours are, we mow all day and they're, it's five miles of edging. We have a line of two different edgers and it, it's got two and a half mile loops of how they edge the most efficient way to edge those properties. The best wow. thing about that is when you go to the property the first day, you already have a plan in place. You're not going to miss any areas and you can show the crew the right way to do it the first time. Because if they do it wrong the first time and you try to show them the second time you go to the job, say like, oh, no, 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 I already, I already got it. So they want help the first time. They don't want help the second time. So yeah. that's been really, really helpful. It's, you know, it doesn't work for really small properties and maybe not needed as much, but for yeah. big properties, it is absolutely necessary. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's funny going back. One, one reason I know we needed it is because I went to a job site. We sold a new property. I said, I'm just going to go look. This is the first day of new property because I don't know what we do now. I'm just going to observe. I'm not going to say anything. I went out there. There was three crews that met at the property and the manager was like, we're going to start here and everyone just mow that way. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I didn't say anything. I'm like, 
that's probably you know good for him. He's trying to do something, but we need we need to get the office staff needs to give better support to helping this. So we came up with process maps, and thanks to Bob Grover and Pacific, but um, thanks to Google as well because they're awesome. It really that's, helped. That's great. It it helps new employees at least the first several times to get an acquaintance to what's going on. And you know everyone has a job, and man, when you go the wrong way or you forget what you've mowed or not mowed or edged or not edged and you got to go back or you got to go fuel up your get, yeah, small the tank. Property, the property manager gets complaints. And with like, with filling up, you get two and a half miles. Our, we have belts with a fuel tank with the blades on the edger blade so they can change it there versus walking back to the truck. Because yeah. how many times did I see a crew before with it over their shoulder, walking back to their truck. I'm like, where's your truck? And they're like, what are for there? I'm like, yeah. oh my God, that's not yeah. going to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Super efficient in your route. I, I, I love it. You know, Tim, it's been uh, a, a great pleasure. Good friend of ours. And it's good to see you grow and develop from, from the days of taking the business from your uh, father into what it is today. So any last minute advice to any of the listeners out there from your experience in the savage mode days? I, <laughs> I believe that was savage mode back in 2018, but I think you're pretty much savage all the time. I, I don't know if you're very like off mode or kind of chill mode. You are like dialed in hardcore, all business, all the time, um, looking for ways to improve and, you know, always learning all the time. Any, any, last minute advice. I appreciate those compliments. Um, yeah, well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to McFarland Stanford. You know, I was in the first discovery group and I was in the first peer group and, you know, everyone at McFarland Stanford, you know, Jason, Jim, Marty, they, they've helped me immensely. The amount I've learned through these groups have been awesome. And I'm very thankful that I, that I was able to make those connections with you all because you guys have helped our business a lot. So thank you. A last minute takeaway I, I say would be key employees. Like I said earlier, you, you definitely don't want to lose your key employees, but can you imagine if your your whoever you're thinking is your best key employee, if you're able to find another key employee? I think I, I just feel like most owners, presidents, you know, people high up in, in the, don't spend as much time as they could recruiting. I think you just get to know everyone in your industry in your area. I just think mm -hmm. I just think there's a lot of good people out there, but. And, and everyone needs a good employee, but we're not spending enough time trying to find those great employees. Yep. Because they make yep. a huge difference when you get them on your team. Yep. Totally agree. And and constantly develop them and coach them and mentor Take care all of them. on the way, right? We got in this yep. business because we, we just love landscape, honestly. I think you enjoy it being outdoors and the Tetris game that you get to play every single day in the business <laughs> as I compare it to my operation that I love so much, but we're, we're very fortunate and blessed to be in this. And it takes the, it takes an army of great people in order to, to do this. So that's great. You know, if I had a name like Tim Trimmer, I want to be very successful. I, I might change my name to Tommy shrub or something like that. And we'll, <laughs> we'll go, we'll go tackle and the think, world. And I think my dad's mom's last name was sprinkle. Are you serious? You can't make it up. You can't make it up. Yes. You can't make it up. Someone told me last week when we're all together, he's like, man, Tim Trimmer, that is just a fact. I'm like, man, if you only knew who he was, he's just a good, <laughs> fun round guy. I and appreciate we spent some time in, in Italy last year, which was a great experience. And thanks, Tim, for all your time. And, and uh, we've got to do this again at some point. Absolutely. Thank you, Tommy. Ready to take the next step? Download our free profitability scorecard to quickly create your own baseline financial assessment and uncover the fastest ways to improve your business. Just go to McFarlandStanford.com slash scorecard to get yours today. To learn more about McFarland Stanford, our best-in-class peer groups, and other services, go to our website at McFarlandStanford.com. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. See you next time on The Roots of Success.